my gosh, I think that is the epitome of extension of grace. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Hey everybody, how are you doing today? I'm so glad that you're here. Happy Sunday. For those of you who are watching online or one of our partner campuses, we're excited that you're here. We're excited um, that you made it through this week. I don't know what you've in, in, in endured throughout the week, but God so saw fit for you to be here today. And so we don't take that for granted. So we're excited to have you here. For those of you who may not know me, my name is April Farmer and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And I'm excited to actually be wrapping up this series um, that we've been in for the past three weeks called Games We Play. And so we love these videos that have been showing from week to week, but we've learned throughout the, the last few weeks about the games that we play, the games that we engage in as it pertains to relationships. And one of the key things that we've learned every week is that when it comes to relationships, a game that requires a loser is a game that nobody wins. And I have to be honest, I'm not a big fan of games. You know, I really wasn't great at them. I'm a musician. I'm a creative. I don't really like to play games. Even when it came to college, you know, we sat around with no money. You just played spades and talk all day. And I, nobody ever wanted me on their team. Like I just played solitaire all the time uh, because nobody wanted me there. And I might be, you know, in trouble when I say this one too. This statement is a little countercultural in the culture that we live in, but I'm not a really huge fan of sports either. Like, I honestly didn't even know that the Olympics started till I looked at IG last night. I had no idea. And I know, I know, shame on me, but I, I wasn't, I'm not a big fan. And I mean, I like sports in general. Like if somebody invites me to a game, I am there. You know, I will totally go. I'll put on all the gear. I'll scream for whatever team the people next to me are screaming on. I don't do that with my husband though, because I like to just, you know, get on his nerves. But the only thing that I might be into a little bit now is maybe basketball and football. And that's because Mr. Farmer loves basketball and football. That is his thing. I didn't realize how much people got into sports until I met my husband. When we were dating, I, um, I lived with my son and, and we didn't have cable. I cut cable off like a long time ago. I just thought it was a waste of money. And so I didn't engage in sports at all. And one day my husband and I are dating, we get home after church and he comes by and I you know, go in the kitchen and I'm cooking and I come back in the living room and he's watching the game. And I'm like, how are you watching the game? He said, oh yeah, we can't date and you don't have cable. I need to watch the game. So he literally ordered cable for my house while we were dating just so he could watch sports. So I get it. People are totally into that. But because of my ignorance of sports, I really wish somebody would have told me not to plan my wedding during the NBA playoffs. I had no idea how intense that was until I was actually on my honeymoon. And I'm making these plans, you know, I'm charting out all the things we're in the condo and I'm charting out all these plans and the activities for us to do. And my husband's just looking at me like, mm-hmm. And he said, okay, I just have one request. Can we please just be back home by six o'clock? Because the game is coming on. And I'm looking at him like, are you serious? Like, you want to pick a game over me? But I wouldn't dare bring that up. I wouldn't have dared said anything about that. You know, I laugh about it now. But to be totally honest, I really felt some type of way. I felt like you picked, you picked in the game over me. Like you want to watch a game or do you want to be all booed up with me? Like, dude, we just got married. We supposed to be booed up. But that's not how he saw it. He was like, yeah, we can be booed all up till six o'clock, you know? <laughs> And so I experienced several emotions about that. I felt hurt and, you know, mostly rejected, but I did not bring it up. Not at all. I could not have. Why? Why would I not bring that up? Because I didn't want to create something that many of us work really hard to steer clear from. And what is that? Conflict. I did not want to create conflict. Nobody likes conflict. Healthy competition is one thing, but conflict in relationships is something else altogether. Nobody likes conflict because conflict doesn't feel good. It's uncomfortable and we try our best to steer clear from it, to stay far away from it as possible. And it's different, it's, it's, it's kind of like this game that I used to play, we all had to play these as a kid. It was this one particular game that a lot of people loved, but I personally hated this game, and it was dodgeball. 
I did not, thank y'all. I did not like dodgeball. The first reason why I didn't like it is because you got to stand in this big old group and the first thing that would happen is that somebody had to pick you for their team. And when you were like me and you were not an athletic person, you were always the last one picked. Do y'all know how embarrassing that was? I mean, even my own brothers, like they never would pick me. They would pick anybody. You just standing there, uh, and you're just like, uh, and they're skipping over you. So I totally hated that. So I was the last one picked and I was always probably the first one out. And so I hated that. But the second thing I hated is that I'm now picked on a team. And as I look across the way to the other team, everybody looks like this guy. (laughs) Everybody on the opposing team looks like this dude. But me and everybody on my team looks like this guy. (laughs) We're timid and scared, and I am the one with the ball coming right at my face. I hated this game. But we all know what the object of this game was. The object of the game is to not get hit by the ball. And you look at him, bless his little heart. He's just kind of standing there like, oh, hurry up, get it over with. And that was me. But the object is to not get hit by the ball. And it's, it's funny as a game. It's even more funny as a movie. Have y'all seen Dodgeball? That was a hilarious movie. Oh, my goodness. I was an average Joe. Absolutely an average Joe. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. But when it comes to relationships... What happens when the ball that's coming directly in your face is a tough conversation that your parents want to have with you, but you don't want to hear it? What if the ball that's coming directly at you is a text message from your best friend wondering why you won't respond to their text? What happens when the ball coming directly at you is your son or your daughter who is calling for the umpteenth time asking for money? What about when the ball coming at you directly is a wellspring of emotions and hurt feelings based on the distance that's been created and the silence that's been created between you and your spouse for weeks? What do you do then? Relationships are tough, yes. Life happens and feelings get hurt And challenges arise and all of those things need to be addressed. Every single solitary one of them. But we tell ourselves, you know what? It's it's, it's no big deal. We tell ourselves, you know what? It'll work itself out. Whoever made that up? It'll work itself out. They'll get over it, you know, you know, they'll grow out of it. It, It'll be okay in time. It'll, it'll, It'll fix itself. And we start to play this game that I call the avoidance game. The avoidance game is essentially relationship conflict dodgeball. And the object of this game is to avoid conflict at all costs. We do not want to engage in any conflict. I am going to get myself out of the path of conflict no matter what it costs me. And in relationships, we do our best to avoid experiencing thoughts or feelings or any situation that brings up any level of discomfort and especially anything that comes close to creating conflict in our relationships. We even sometimes go as far as to even deny that the situation is even happening. We just say, what? What are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. That's you. That's not me. I don't know what you're talking about. We say these things all the time. But the truth is, is that conflict is an inevitable, uh, completely normal part of the human experience. And yet many people will readily admit that they intentionally avoid anything that even remotely resembles a disagreement or a confrontation. We all do it. And why do we need to avoid conflict? For most of us, we're afraid of the hurt feelings that arise from it, feelings of rejection, feelings of of brokenness and distance and, and, and hurt, just pain. And many of us see conflict as a negative experience. We always assume and we believe that it's only going to lead to pain and drama. And nobody wants to be in the middle of drama. But the fact of the matter is that the avoidance game is a losing game every single solitary time. And nobody ever wins in the avoidance game. 
And the more that we, we think that we're winning, the more we are actually losing. The more we dodge the conflict, the more distance is being created in the relationship. We're losing. And what is it that we're losing? We're losing trust. We're losing opportunity for intimacy. We're losing security. We're losing valuable time and relational equity. There's so much at stake when it comes to avoidance. And now all that conversation that your parents want to have, it just ceases altogether. And they just stop reaching out. Now the best friend that's been texting you incessantly wanting to get in kind with tack with you, it's zero. It's nothing. They stop texting altogether. And now you find yourself dodging your son or your daughter, afraid to say no to them, afraid to chase, to, 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 to face their, insig- their, uh, their problems with their money. You don't want to bring it up. You don't want to talk about it. And they don't know why you keep dodging them. And now the distance that's been created between you and your spouse has resulted in papers being served. The avoidance game leaves in its wake a cemetery of the remains of broken relationships. Think about it. All of us can look back and remember things that we dodged and we avoided and we did not want to deal with. And a lot of those relationships are non-existent or they're broken or they're distant. And that is not the life that we've been called to. So how do we stop playing this avoidance game? And I thought about that. Well, how do do we stop engaging in this game? How do we stop playing this game? So I thought about it. This is the way I think. Well, if avoid means to keep away from or to dodge, then the opposite of avoid is to confront. This is what we do. To confront means to face up to and to deal with whatever that situation is. And confrontation can carry negative connotations. I understand that. I know people are getting nervous already. I don't like conflict. I don't like confrontation. I don't want to deal with that. But all confrontation isn't bad. Confrontation is actually necessary for reconciliation. Why is that the case? Why is confrontation necessary? Because confrontation provides a space for invitation, for correction, for wisdom, for a person to be seen and feel heard and acknowledged. It creates a space for grace and for love, whether you're the person being confronted or the person who's confronting. Confrontation is necessary. And there are two uh, stories that I found in the gospels that I think convey the need for confrontation and the beauty actually of confrontation. And these two stories, these two relationships just display it so beautifully. And the first one I found that I wanna talk about today is the relationship between Jesus and Judas. Yes, Judas. In the book of Matthew, he records this journey that Jesus was taking with his disciples through Bethany. And they come across this woman who has heard about Jesus and she's adoring Jesus. She recognizes him for who she is. And she's carrying with her this alabaster box full of fragrant and expensive perfume. And what does she do in the presence of all of these disciples and all of these witnesses? She goes to Jesus, she breaks this expensive box and she pours this expensive pricely oil on the head of Jesus, anointing him. And the scripture tells us that the disciples were indignant. They were infuriated, thinking to themselves and even saying like, why would she waste such precious expensive oil on pouring it on a person's head? We could have used that money to give it to the poor. And Jesus so graciously, uh, um, he, he, he talks to them and he tells them, no, 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 what she did is necessary. She is doing what you don't even understand yet. She's anointing me for what's to come. And then right after that in Matthew 26, This is what happened. It says, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples went to the leading priests and asked, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? 
and they gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus, to betray him, to deliver him up to his enemies, to the ones who wanted to kill him, to destroy him. Judas, of all people, and for what? 30 pieces of silver. In our day and age, it would be roughly about 91 to 400 some odd dollars, U.S. dollars. That's it. Depending on what coin was used, that's how much it was worth. Nothing. And Judas, he's looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. This man that he lived with, this man that he walked with, this man that he ate with, this man that taught him everything he knew, that was leading him and guiding him in the truth, he betrayed him. And then the story continues. And it says, when it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the 12. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. Now put yourself in Jesus's shoes. The first thing I notice about Jesus here, or I remember about Jesus here, is that Jesus is fully God in flesh. And because he is fully God, he is fully all-knowing. And he knowingly sits down and has a meal with the man that he knows is about to betray him. And Jesus does not avoid the situation. He does not avoid this conflict that is going to arise. He's not avoiding this situation. He is fully God and he knows, but he's also fully man. How do you think Jesus felt in that moment? moment. Put yourself in Jesus's shoes. Would you sit down with a person that you knew that was betraying you? Would you share a meal, an act of kinship and friendship with a person that you knew was sending you to your death, was participating in your demise? But Jesus did. The story continues. It says, greatly distressed, each one of the disciples asked in turn, am I the one, Lord? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. He says, one of you. When I saw that, what I realized is that Jesus is creating an opportunity for the guilty party to come forward. Jesus is creating space here. For he's creating this invitation for for reconciliation to happen. He's creating this opportunity for Judas to make a different choice. He's not avoiding it. He is stepping right into it. He's given him an opportunity to make it right, to confess. But what does Judas do? It goes on, it says, Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, just like all the rest of the disciples, Rabbi, am I the one? Kind of reminded me of that song, you know, Judah stole the cookie from the cookie jar. Who, me? Yeah, you couldn't be. Then who? Judas is sitting here acting like, oh, could it be me? He knows exactly who it is. And Jesus said, he told him, he said, you have said it. Jesus didn't respond and say, I don't know. Is it you? He said, yes, you have said it. He confronted him face to face, dead on. And the story continues, as we all know, unfortunately, Judas actually did follow through with betraying Jesus. Not only did he betray his master, not only did he betray Jesus, he betrayed him with a kiss. With a kiss, with a form of friendship, with an act of friendship and camaraderie, he goes to Jesus and he kisses him, which was the signal to the Pharisees and the religious leaders that this is the one who you should arrest. And as I continue to read this story, something stood out to me when I read it. In verse 50, it says this, Jesus said to Judas, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Friend? Jesus called Judas friend? How could Jesus call him a friend? Jesus wasn't being sarcastic here. Jesus was a real straight shooter. If you've read any of the gospels, if you've read any of the accounts about Jesus, Jesus called it like he saw it, no matter who it was. 
He actually called the religious leaders and the Pharisees, he called them a brood of vipers to their face. So Jesus did not mince his words. He called him a friend. He looked in the face of the one who would betray him and called him friend. Why did he do that? I believe that that's because he realized and he acknowledged that that's who Judas was. Judas was Jesus's friend. Jesus did not allow the conflict. Jesus did not allow this betrayal to change the status of their relationship. He, he knew what Judas was doing. And he also knew what we learn in 2 Peter 1 through verse 4. And it tells us that we, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against the person. It's not against the person who is standing in front of us, the one who has wronged us. Jesus knew this. And he looked past how Satan was using Judas and he saw who Judas really was, his friend. The avoidance game allows hurt feelings to just fester and grow on the inside of our hearts, which can change and muddy the relationship, it can change how we see the person who has hurt us. And so now when we play this avoidance game and we don't face this conflict, the person who we're seeing, we don't see our friend, we see our enemy. We don't see our child, we see an enemy. We don't see our spouse or our coworker or the person in small group with us. We see a person who is our enemy and our behavior coincides with how we see them. Loving confrontation, however, brings clarity. Loving confrontation creates an opportunity to address the issue without changing the relationship. This is what loving confrontation does. But just like this story, every loving confrontation doesn't end on a happy note. And we know this. While Judas regretted what he did, as you continue reading the story, Judas regretted what he did after the fact. But unfortunately, his story ends tragically. But Jesus didn't avoid it. However, there's another story I want to look at. There's another story where Jesus lovingly confronts another friend, another disciple. And his name was Peter. And his story ends differently. Matthew continues in chapter 26, verse 31, and it says, On the way, Jesus told all of the disciples, he told them, Tonight, all of you will desert me. Peter declared, Even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. <laughs> and Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. Oh, no. Who, me? No, Peter insisted. Absolutely not. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. Peter knew. But think about it. You literally just told Jesus he was a liar. <laughs> think about that. You sit here and you telling the creator of the universe, the one that you have declared to be the Messiah. Oh, no, you don't know that. You don't know what you're talking about, Lord. You, you, you're mistaken, creator of the universe. You're lying. How arrogant. Our brother Peter was an arrogant brother. And Jesus knew that. He knew that that arrogance would impact their relationship. So what does he do? He lovingly confronted him about his arrogance. And so, so sure enough, Peter did exactly what Jesus said that he would do. And I mean, when he did it, he did it bad. It was so bad that Peter was so adamant about his denial of Jesus that his behavior even started to change. When you read the story, it's like he wasn't even acting like a follower of Jesus would act. He wanted so much to deny him that he totally changed how he behaved so that people could look at him and see him and maybe say, well, maybe he wasn't. It goes on to say in verse 44, uh, 74, it says, Peter swore. I mean, literally, when you look up swore, he cursed. He says, a curse on me if I'm lying. Woo, how bold. I don't know the man. And immediately, what happened? The rooster crowed. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. 
before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. Loving confrontation brings conviction. Loving confrontation brings conviction. And when we look back at this story, notice that Jesus didn't try to convince Peter that he was right. Hey, oh, that bothers me. (laughs) Because that's me. I own it. I admit it. If you're in a relationship with me and you know that's true, just keep your eyes forward. I have a hard time trying to get my point across. Maybe that's why I'm a preacher. But sometimes when I'm in conflict with a person, I like to try to make them see. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't say, no, man, I'm telling you the truth. Listen to me. No, you are going to deny me. No, you do have an arrogance problem. And many of us, we have that same problem. We're in our relationship and we try to lovingly confront a person and they don't want to hear it. And we keep going and we keep going and we keep going. But that's like kicking your head against a stone. But you know what Jesus did? He did something different. And I learned so much as I was studying this. And it's a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. Pray for me. But Jesus did something (laughs) that was so simple. He confronted the issue. He addressed the issue lovingly. And then what did he do? He prayed for Peter. He prayed for him. Luke's account of this same story tells us that Jesus said this to Peter in chapter 22. He says, Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you what? When you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Unlike his fellow disciple, Judas, whose story ended tragically, Peter's story ends beautifully. Jesus is is, is crucified and he is then resurrected. And after Jesus' resurrection, he meets with all his disciples and they share a meal together. And in John 21, verse 15, it says this, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And look what he says. He said, Lord, You know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I love the turnaround. He says, before he's saying, Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. I would never deny you. And he denied him three times. But now Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? And what did he say now? You know everything. Loving confrontation, it brings clarity. Loving confrontation brings conviction. And loving confrontation brings reconciliation. Notice the three times. Peter denied three times. And now Jesus gives him an opportunity to affirm three times his love for him. I think that is so amazing. And what was most impactful for me as I'm studying this is that Jesus prayed for Peter. He prayed for him. He knew that he was struggling with pride, but he didn't try to fix him. He addressed it and he prayed. He addressed it and he moved on. And so my question today is how do we step into following Jesus's example? How do we step into loving confrontation? Instead of playing this avoidance game where I wanna dodge and dip and skirt around what's happening, how do I lovingly step into confrontation? Well, the first thing is we step into it prayerfully, just like Jesus did, prayerfully. And what I mean by that is check your own heart. Check your heart. 
Confrontation should never be done in anger or in the heat of the moment. Notice Jesus was reclining at a table both times. With Judas, they were reclining, having a meal. He wasn't being belligerent. He wasn't confronting in anger. He was calm, cool, and collected. He wasn't angry, and so neither should we be angry when we confront our loved ones and and confront the issues that are going on in our relationships. And we should never confront people to inflict pain or shame or disgrace to them or to seek revenge. And mostly we should not confront to win. This is not what this is about, but we are to check our hearts, to search our hearts. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, you know what, is the problem just me? Do I even need to address this at all? Lord, search my heart and know me. Search me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. And then point me in the direction that I should go. This is how we should lovingly approach confrontation. So we should do it prayerfully. We should also do it gracefully, full of grace. Our intent should always be to extend grace and mercy to the person, and also forgiveness. This is exactly how we see Jesus approach both Judas and Peter. He did it gracefully. His whole intent was to restore. This is how we should approach it. We should value the relationship over the issue and extend grace always. And let reconciliation be the goal, even if it's not the guaranteed outcome. That's facts. It may not turn out the way you want. It may not turn out, well, they'll say, you know what? Yeah, I did it. I'm sorry. Let's get this right. Let's work this out. It may end tragically. It may end where the relationship is not uh, restored. However, our intent should always be reconciliation, just like Jesus. So we lovingly approach conflict prayerfully, gracefully, and lovingly. Love should be the motivator for everything we do. Don't be afraid to share the truth, but share it in love. Loving confrontation creates an opportunity for lies to be dispelled. Those those thoughts that come when you don't address an issue, where you leave the other person to just kind of wonder and come up to their own conclusions because we won't talk about it. Has that happened for anybody else besides me? Or you're just drawing your own conclusions. Well, you won't talk to me about it, so I feel like this is what's happening. But when you lovingly confront, it creates the space for the truth to come to light. And it dispels the myth. And when truth comes to light, restoration and reconciliation can happen. And that is our goal. That is the win. As we've said this entire series, the win is the relationship That is the victory. And Jesus values relationships. They aren't toys to be played with. It's not a game to play with Jesus. Relationships are serious to him. They matter greatly. And he didn't avoid addressing the tension or the things or the sin that broke our relationship with him. He addressed it directly. He didn't leave us in our own sin. He directly addressed that situation, the things that broke our relationship with him, with the creator of the universe. He loved us so much that he did not ignore the sin that separated us from him. But his confrontation was fierce. He pursued us with the greatest extent of love that anybody could. So much so that he addressed our sin directly. He gave us what we needed. He provided the means by which we could be reconciled to him. He did whatever it took for us to be back in right relationship with him. He gave his life so that we could have relationship. Relationship matters to Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God didn't avoid my sin. I'm glad that my sin wasn't so egregious to him that the thing that I did that that, that disgraced him, that dishonored him, that made his heart hurt, that broke his feelings, he didn't avoid it. He didn't dodge me and he didn't dodge you. 
He didn't dodge any of us, but he stepped right into it. And he said, I love you. And I want this relationship with you so much that I'm gonna sacrifice myself to bring you clarity so you can see how our relationship got separated. I'm gonna sacrifice myself so that as you see clearly what you've done, how you broke this relationship, that you can see clearly and your heart can be convicted and thereby we can be reconciled to one another. Why? Because I love you and I wanna know you and I wanna live with you and I wanna be in relationship with you. I don't want anything to break us up ever again. Relationship matters to God. Your relationship with him and our relationships with each other. Why each other? Because our relationships with one another are the beautiful, beautiful depiction of God's relationship with us. So when we lovingly confront issues in the relationships that are around us, people can see, oh, they worked that out. They reconciled that situation. They made it right. How beautiful, I wonder how they did that. Why would they pursue right relationship with that person after what happened? I don't understand. And it creates an opportunity for us to display the love that God has for us. So I wanna encourage you today, don't play the avoidance game. Lovingly confront that thing that's already stirred up in your heart, that relationship that you know you miss. And you know, you might need to take a step forward in lovingly confronting them. Not in anger, not to win, not to be right, but to restore and to reconcile the relationship. That's the win, the relationship. So I wanna encourage you this week, figure out what that relationship is. Where is it? What do you need to reconcile with that person? And even in this moment, for some of us, it's our relationship with God. I would be remiss to talk about avoiding conflict and not invite you to step in to the conflict that some of us have with our heavenly father. That sin in our lives that keeps us separated from him. But again, Jesus made the way. He says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse all of us from all of our unrighteousness, that we can be reconciled to the Father by believing in him, by turning away from that things that keep us separated and walking in love with him and sharing that love with others. So if you're here today and you need to make that relationship right with your heavenly Father, do it now. Don't avoid it, don't delay. Now is the time, today is the day. Make the decision and pray right where you are. Father, I recognize that I am a sinner. I recognize that my life is not aligned with the truth of your word, of your holiness and your goodness. I recognize that you are God and I am not. And I have arrogantly lived my life according to my own standard, but God, I recognize that I need you and I want relationship with you. Would you please forgive me of my sin and restore our relationship? And I promise you, if that is your heart, if that is your prayer, he has already wiped it clean and he is yours and you are his. For some of us in the room, we've been following and walking with Jesus for a while. But there's some things that we know that are gone on in our lives and we've been avoiding addressing God about it. Hey, Today is the day. Let's step into reconciliation with Jesus. There's nothing you could do, nothing that we could ever do that could keep God from us. He's willing and available and ready to forgive all. So let's make it right. Let's confront and reconcile with our Father. And He promises to be right there and to restore that relationship. And we don't have to worry about it anymore. And yeah, we'll mess up again. Lord knows I will and you will, even with the people that we love and the people that we're in relationship with. But thank God for grace and mercy. Amen? Amen. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you didn't avoid us. (laughs) I thank you so much that you didn't avoid 
what separated us from you. And just as you have made a way for us to be reconciled with you, God, because relationships matter to you. Father, if there's relationships we need to make right, give us the courage to step lovingly and graciously and prayerfully into confronting that situation and seeing that person clearly as a person that we love and that we desire to be in relationship with and helping us to restore that relationship if that is so your will. I know it's your will, God, and I know we don't always get it right. Sometimes we're the person being confronting and we don't wanna deal with it. God, give us the courage to say we're sorry. Give us the courage to not have to be the person who wins, but help us to value relationship just like you do, to follow your example. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for wanting to be in relationship with us. Help us to demonstrate what you have so graciously and lovingly done to us, to those that are around us, so that people can see our exchanges and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Because ultimately, God, this is all about you. We honor you, we thank you, and we bless you for the truth of your word, for your grace and your goodness. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.